be very excited about. Um, so without further ado, I present Doug Tatro. Thanks, Christy, uh, and welcome everybody on this Wednesday morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to jump in here in a moment, um, and I actually do have a colleague with me, so we'll introduce ourselves before we get in. Um, so as Christy mentioned, my name is Doug Tatro. I am with uh, TAC. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization, but we operate much like a consulting and training firm. So we work with HUD and VA and continuous of care like yourselves focused on uh, all things ending homelessness. And I'm joined today, and, I, and I'll say too, for those, some of you have heard this from me before, but I do hail from New Hampshire. I am I live currently in Manchester, uh, and oftentimes we work in different parts of the country. So I always love to reconnect uh, with my local team here. Um, so I did do a hiatus in, in Boston for a little while, but you don't have to judge me on that. Um, I came back home uh, uh, evermore. Uh, so that's me. I'm going to be one of the facilitators today. I uh, also want to uh, give my colleague Chelsea Mahoney an opportunity to introduce herself. So Chelsea, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, good morning, everyone. My name is Chelsea Mahoney. I am with the Technical Assistance Collaborative. I am based out of Raleigh, North Carolina, and excited to be uh, co-presenting with you all today. Thank you, Chelsea. And fortunately, North Carolina doesn't have any major sport team rivals with New England. So we'll let, we'll let you stay on the call here uh, for a little bit. Um, we're going to jump in uh, just with, that's okay, going too fast. Um, so as, as Christy mentioned, this is the first of a series that we're putting together throughout the course of this year, some of which may be refresher for some or old news, some of which may be new, uh, but it is designed to be a series. So today we're really going to just begin to introduce the concept and the history of Housing First with a little bit of the myth busting that Christy mentioned, um, uh, probably more geared toward folks who haven't been as exposed to Housing First principles in the past. And as we move through the year, we're going to build out kind of the foundation we build today into different places. So thinking about uh, Housing First at a system level, what does it mean for things like coordinated entry and service design? Then we'll get a little bit more focused on specific types of services in later sessions starting with how we infuse housing principles in our outreach settings, uh, day centers or other shelter settings, moving on then into uh, similar but, but different uh, pointers and discussion around how Housing First works in a rapid rehousing intervention or permanent supportive housing. And then we'll do a little bit more skills focus as we go along and throughout the series, but also to capstone at the end, uh, we'll be we'll be talking about how housing first principles and, and homeless systems in general can work to promote equity um, across populations, uh, as well as using data uh, to promote that. So that is the sort of arc of the narrative that we're going to continue to build out. And I will say that uh, the purpose of these trainings, is, you know, there's a lot of didactic. We'll be using the chat some. Um, but we really want to, you know, uh, bend our discussions to meet your needs. So today's really well preset. So like, if yeah. folks can mute, that would be great too. Yeah. Um, all right, we're muted. Uh, uh, either way, uh, so we have not yet kind of designed every one of these sessions, and so I would in invite folks to share feedback with Christy, with the team on what is most useful, what may not be useful, and we can we can sort of adapt as we go to make sure. Today, we won't have a ton of discussion base. We wanted to see how many folks we're gonna be on. We'll have some chat, uh, but we can certainly add like those layers in as we go throughout the year. So that's our overall agenda. Today, we're gonna kick in uh, with uh, a general overview, some of what it looks like in, in action, and then some uh, discussion around equity, Again, this is our foundation sort of 101 introduction to Housing First. For those of you who've been around for a while or, or feel like you're really strong here, we welcome you and encourage you to stay and, and listen uh, carefully and, and contribute in the chat or if there's time to come off mute later. Uh, but this will be kind of our level setting uh, session. In, in that uh, spirit, it looks like folks have already begun to introduce themselves in the chat. Would welcome you to continue to do so. If you've already put your name, maybe add in your favorite New Hampshire spring activity. Um, I'll just give mine verbally. Uh, my, my wife and I started 
uh, hiking more adamantly in this past couple of years. And we didn't get out to a decent hike uh, this winter, even though we invested in all the winter gear last year. Uh, so uh, in two weeks, we get back up north uh, for our first hike of the spring. So that's one of my new or renewed uh, favorite spring activities here in New Hampshire. And uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, we got other folks that like to hike. We should share some notes there. Kayaking, dog walking. Uh, I like that one, Christina. I got a dog last year and it's definitely added my to my steps every day. Um, visiting camp for spring cleanup, uh, all sorts of good stuff. So keep those going in the chat and we'll jump right in. Uh, we do have quite a few slides here, but we've got plenty of time. So, so we're talking about housing first, and this may mean different things to different people. Uh, so we're going to at least begin by defining housing first. And this is a framework. It's not a program. Um, you, none of you run housing first programs. Uh, you may operate programs that follow the housing first approach or principles or framework. And it is centered on the belief that everyone can achieve stability in housing out of homelessness. And that stable housing is the foundational platform for folks pursuing other goals. And you know, we've talked about over the years, and, and I've said, and many on this call have probably said that housing is a basic human right. And I continue to believe that, and I hope all of you do too. The, the nuance to that is I actually think that it's a basic human necessity. When we think about our ability to navigate the complexities of everyday life, um, we often uh, uh, need the foundation of housing that allows us to pursue those goals. And so Housing first is a way to think about housing as the foundation for other types of goals, whether it be income related, family related, recovery related goals, if they choose to pursue those. And the, the overall purpose is to quickly connect people uh, to permanent housing and recognizing that homelessness is a crisis. And in order for us to end homelessness, we have to remove uh, maybe the historical or even current preconditions that we've put on folks uh, to access housing, things like uh, enough income to sustain when we have uh, the ability to provide those subsidies or sobriety uh, or, or recovery or, or treatment services and participation in those recovery services as a condition of working to get people housed. Um, it also means that we need to be able to support people in maintaining that housing stability and recognize that coming out of a, of a crisis situation, folks are going to need that support. So it is not a complicated set of principles, though it may be a complicated and difficult practice to implement when we know that these four or five bullets are sort of a utopian kind of outlook around uh, the ease with which we can connect people who have significant housing barriers and needs into permanent housing. But our kind of premise starts with the idea that those who have the most significant barriers and needs are those who are most uh, in, in dire need of being connected to housing and supported in that housing so that they can break down those barriers and, and, and needs, or at least be able to manage those barriers and needs in a safe environment uh, in permanent housing. What I want to start with, though, is something that we've done on these trainings with this team or parts of this team before, and I think it's always worth resetting and reminding ourselves of the folks that we're working with and the stress and trauma that they're experiencing in that experience of homelessness. So oftentimes we think of or sort of prejudge or have implicit or explicit biases toward the people that the very people that we're trying to work with. And this is not a fault of anybody. This is not a uh, uh, you know, a shortcoming of our professional lives, but it's a reality of the human nature that we all experience. So if we look at the folks on screen, as we think about the folks we work with, we encounter an African-American male experiencing homelessness, uh, 52 years old, he's late to the appointment, he's been complaining and irritable, perhaps suspicious, you can smell liquor, uh, they're not making eye contact, um, or a white uh, Latinx woman who's experiencing homelessness. She's young. Uh, she seems sad and hopeless. She's worrying. She's talking over you. Uh, a mother of three, uh, very young. Um, she's not having difficult concentrating. She's got poor hygiene. Think about what those negative, uh, sort of inherent negative reactions may be that you feel, uh, whether or not you carry out any action based on those negative reactions when you sort of encounter these types of folks in your daily work? What are the judgments that we often make on people just at first sight or first discussion 
that may uh, contribute toward our own biases and how we support that person or what we may think that person is capable of doing. And in an in-person uh, training experience, we would do this as, as, as a group work. But I, all, I want you all to be thinking, are these the types of folks that you may encounter in your professional life? And even if you are outwardly and proactively supportive and recognizing their trauma, where are those implicit biases or those negative reactions you may have to somebody who walks into your office, you have an appointment and they have liquor on their breath or somebody who's talking over you or not focusing on the task at hand when you meet with them. Now think about uh, in your own kind of life, a time when you faced a very difficult situation, uh, it was very important to you, you didn't feel that you had any control over it and perhaps that that situation lasted uh, more than a month or, or some prolonged period of time. And let's open up the chat. Let's see how uh, active we have folks. I'm gonna move my chat over so I can see. Uh, what are some of the ways that you felt and acted in your own life uh, when you faced this difficult situation that was an important thing to you that felt like you were losing control and, and that it persisted for some period of time? What are some, whether it's you or common reactions or feelings that folks may display when in these types of situations? Anxiousness, thank you, Robert. Nervous, stressed. Other folks, you're angry. Thank you, Daniel. Panic, um, anxiousness, scattered, bitter, frustrated. What are some other words that we angry again? Distracted. There's a lot of words here that begin to capture our three fictional clients in the slide before. Any other frozen, uh, right? Unworthy helplessness, feeling like you're drowning under that pressure, disoriented, frightened right on edge uh that's i think on edge is a good word i recently went through a life change a few months ago and my wife for the first time in uh, many years was being to get us man you're really on edge this week and i said well yeah there's a lot going on frantic right so we have these uh these inherent reactions whether this way we act the way we feel not feeling like yourself and these can manifest internally or externally uh based on the situation and and how long that goes along a lot of what you all are putting in the chat and what we may have seen with the folks that we encountered in the slide earlier are uh, clear signs of symptoms and symptoms of stress and stress overload as defined by the Mayo Clinic. And oftentimes these symptoms can resolve uh, slowly or quickly, uh, but when the crisis is over, and in this case, we again begin with the premise that housing allows us to mitigate against this crisis, that we can begin to self-resolve these symptoms. But oftentimes, while folks are under an, an immense amount of stress, they're experiencing a significant amount of trauma, their emotions and behaviors be, are, are less under control, right? So then we think about, if we, we start to recognize the stress that folks are under, the stress that you all felt in those situations, quietly think now and take a second, and I'll, and I'll create an awkward pause here in just a moment to allow you to, a secret that no one knows about you, and perhaps you don't want anyone to know about you. And say I asked you to write that secret on a piece of paper, uh, and I told you we wouldn't share it, but I asked you to write that down. What would you feel about that? How would it make you feel to have to write down on a piece of physical paper that secret, that deep, dark secret that nobody had ever heard uh, and that you don't want to share? What are some of the words that come to mind or feelings? And you can put those in the chat as well. What is, I'm not asking for the secret. I just want to know, how does it make you feel if someone asks you to write that secret down? Hesitant, yep. You don't trust me to do that. Not trusting, thank you, Heidi. Uneasy, why do I have to write this down? Terrified, embarrassed. Uneasy again, good. You don't want to do this, right? Even right now, many of you may be uncomfortable thinking about the idea that you're going to take this one secret you've held for your whole life or the last minute or the last year and have to share it with somebody. Now, what if I asked you to tell me that secret on this call or write it to me in a private chat? How would you feel then? What honesty would come out? What would you feel if after you came in and you wrote down your, your secret, you felt annoyed, you felt that reduction, you felt embarrassed, and I said, I now I need you to share that with me. We just met today. You know, Mandy, I can see on my screen, so I'm picking up on you. Mandy and I just met, and I've asked her to write down her deepest, darkest secrets. 
And then I tell her I need, and she needs to share that with me. What would Mandy be feeling? Annoyed? The word we're looking for here would be shame. Who here would feel shame in sharing that deepest, darkest secret with somebody they just met while they're in a crisis situation under stress? A right? powerless doubt. So as we think about housing first, and as we think about the ability for us to provide supportive, trauma-informed environments to work with people, we have to recognize in ourselves what are some of the symptoms that we see when we're under stress and how does that manifest into people who are coming to us for help oftentimes in the worst day or worst month or worst year of their life and looking for help and then asking them to tell us why did you lose your housing? What happened to your family? Tell me your social security number. What's your income? Why don't you have income? When was your last drink? Do you have a mental health disorder that's been diagnosed? What is that mental health disorder? Are you getting treatment for your mental health disorder? Do you do any illegal or illicit activity that supports your income? How do we stop doing that? Do you have a criminal record? How invasive uh, are we uh, by necessity in some ways and by choice in others? for folks who are under this tremendous amount of stress, feeling this shame as they approach us again on that worst day of our life. And this is not just a political or, or, or personal philosophy of let's be nice to people and not cause trauma. Let's think about this for a moment. And this will be our, our only science uh, sort of uh, presentation of the day. But when your brain is feeling good, uh, hopefully all of you right now, and I feel pretty good this morning. Um, I got out my little walk with my dog this morning. It's a beautiful April day here in New Hampshire. My prefrontal cortex uh, hopefully is on uh, most cylinders, right? We are alert, we are safe, uh, we feel like we can manage situations, we are able to think through rational and regulated behavior because we're not under a tremendous amount of stress or a, a tremendous amount of pressure or trauma at the moment, at least in the context of what we're doing here today. Now, if we think about that flight or flight that you know historically has always been the way we talk about people reacting to stress, we can see that not only do we have outward and sort of internal um, uh, challenges, our feelings, our actions that react to that stress, but our brain chemistry literally changes where our ability, um, our prefrontal cortex that allows us to do that top-down regulation becomes weaker in, in stressful situations and other parts of our brain take over. And our stress response goes into uh, making sure that we can survive, but it reduces our overall ability to do that um, critical thinking in those executive functions. So not only is this the, you know, the idea of housing first and crisis response and, 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 and recognizing the stress and trauma that folks are experiencing when they show up at our door or we show up at their, their uh, encampment or we knock on their car window in the middle of the night or whatever it may be, um, not not only is it the right thing to do, which I think everyone on this call would believe, but it is part of how our brains react to different situations. And so by reducing stress, reducing the crisis and trauma at hand, we offer the ability for that prefrontal cortex to come back into play. And it empowers people to be our partner in their housing plan versus us having to have a, a, a sort of reaction. And we, and we base our ability to move toward that prefrontal cortex on our ability to help people secure that basic foundation for other types of goals, which is permanent housing. So our stress effect really diminishes our ability to solve problems, to modify behaviors, to create and follow through with plans, uh, to override impulsive behaviors, to listen and remember and retrieve information. There's a really uh, 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 foundational reason why when somebody is is um, meeting with doctors and is about to get a medical diagnosis that medical teams will suggest somebody be with that, a loved one or a, or a cared one, be with that person during that. And that is not an emotion, just an emotional support process. That is literally uh, because the folks who are receiving that difficult information will have a difficult time understanding that information just based on the stress that comes from it. And so it's the same idea here under this crisis response. Now, when we think about what it takes to get into housing right now or get a job, you know, we have one of the tightest rental markets in the history in, in, in the country um, uh, based on our wealth and capita here in New Hampshire. We have uh, a tremendous amount of downward pressure coming on from the housing market. We have folks that uh, we have a low unemployment rate. 
um, but we have a, a lack of like the service employment and other sort of uh, jobs that folks may go into from a training perspective. We have all of these systems that people need to navigate in order for them to be able to regain access to housing, to regain access to employment, to regain access to effective or affordable childcare, to be able to reconnect with family and friends and reintegrate into their community in a positive and healthy way. And we try to do these things while folks are under that stress. So if we, if we frame ourselves in thinking about what does it take to get into housing? What would it take for us? Uh, for anyone who's had to move abruptly, um, uh, personal story is, is we, you know, when I moved back to New Hampshire, we were renting for a while before we thought where we wanted to, to invest in our home. And uh, our landlord sold that condo, right? And we didn't have the opportunity to plan the timing we wanted to move. And there's a tremendous amount of stress. And we had to actively, my wife and I, think through how are we going to, what is the next step for us in this process under just the stress, knowing that we, we had housing and we weren't going to become literally homeless. We had backup systems and that still became so important. And, and the, the amount of work it took to navigate our next housing option and what that was going to look like was tremendous. And then you add on the layers of barriers that folks are facing. And we, we can see that in order for someone to accomplish the things that we hope they can accomplish, they physically and mentally uh, and emotionally are incapable of doing so without some level of support and some level of our ability to try to reduce that, that trauma and get that prefrontal cortex back in a place where it can solve problems it can work on plans and move forward. So as we get into this five-part series, we just wanted to start with this, this, these few minutes to really kind of uh, offer uh, uh, what that means and reframe the work that we do. Whether you're a program manager or director, whether you are a direct care uh, person, all of our systems, all of our programs, the way in which we're oriented as a community, as a state, as a balance of state, the way that your case managers or your supervisors are oriented to the project and the project to the client and the client to the project, all contribute toward this, this sort of uh, coordinated algorithm of trying to help people reduce stress, reduce that trauma, reduce that crisis situation, using housing as a platform that allow us then to be, again, a partner with them in that housing plan and, and getting that, uh, that brain chemistry rebalanced from a stress point of view so that we can pursue other goals. And that brings us to sort of the premise of housing first. And I'm just looking at the chat and I wanna mention, Chelsea and I will be watching the chat if there are questions, if you don't believe us, if you have an example of what you've seen, where you're hearing from us that you've seen in real life that you wanna raise up, uh, put it in the chat, raise your hand, we'll keep an eye out. We do wanna make sure we can bring in other voices as we go along. But with that, as we now that we've talked about sort of the client a little bit and, and done this simple exercise to reset. And I would strongly suggest if you have new staff uh, coming into this training or as you hire moving forward, that you start with some of these exercises. Help folks understand not only that the clients that you're working with face barriers or that they are uh, in dire need of housing, but what that looks like from a human response. How would we react as human beings in a similar situation and what are the, some of the strategies that we could use to overcome the shame that we feel, the stress that we feel, the trauma that we're enduring in our experience of homelessness? How can we translate that internalized uh, uh, anecdote or feeling into the way that we practice our services uh, in, in the real world? And uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chelsea to start with some history around housing first, and then we'll get some into some of the underlying principles on the housing side and the service side, and we'll go from there. We'll keep an eye on the chat. So, uh, uh, Chelsea, I want to bring you in here, and I have the slides, and I can move them uh, as you uh, just tell me next slide. Thank you, Doug. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so, in discussing the history of Housing First, it's important to know how we got to this approach as a community and how we believe that this is how we should work with our participants moving forward. Um, in the 1980s, we saw an increase of what we would call the modern um, homelessness in our system, in our community. Um, with this increase, it was a very visual representation of our homeless part population within the United States being visible to the rest of the world, we saw a deinstitutionalization of those that were dealing with 
mental health conditions where they were leaving from community-based services and housing, um, and many of them ended up living on the streets. We also saw some increase in our co-occurring homelessness with HIV and AIDS um, and other behavioral health disorders within the community. We also saw reductions in SSI, which led um, to a lower income in many metropolitan communities, higher unemployment rates, gentrif gentrification of communities and cities. Um, and then there were cuts to HUD, which also led to some lack of affordable housing within the community. Um, and so with that, these kind of became, became looked at as underlying conditions of homelessness. And you can go to the next slide, Doug. And from this kind of theory that these are the underlying conditions of homelessness, we came the um, this staircase model, also known as the linear model, uh, became kind of the homeless response systems plan to address homelessness. Um, so you would come in, we would encounter an individual who was homeless, and we would say these are the steps to take in order to get you to permanent housing. First, we need to address what are these underlying conditions. So if you have mental health concerns, let's connect you to some providers. And you would need to get that addressed prior to being able to be ready to be housed. Um, same thing when we're talking about those that may have any um, sobriety concerns or those that have behavioral health concerns or challenges. And so there were these steps that took place. You couldn't just move from homelessness to permanent housing. We believe we engage with you. We put you into the shelter system. We connect you to a treatment, maybe psych psychiatric stability. Um, or different things, and then transition you slowly um, as you agree to engage in these services till you're ready to become permanently housed. Um, and so this led to some con disconnect on what's the difficulty in getting some people housed. Once again, the belief that we needed to get all these other things in line and correct in order to become permanently housed. Go ahead to the next slide, Doug. Um, however, of course, with anything, we did some additional studies and noticed that because we were operating in such a system-centered goal of we need to, once we encounter a participant, we need to connect them to services, we need to connect them to these treatments to address these underlying conditions, and then we can get them to permanent housing, there was a disengagement that happened with our participants, um, whether, like Doug said, they were in such traumatic situations, homelessness itself is the tra is the trauma. Um, and so forcing them to engage in these services in order to obtain these goals and saying, we cannot get you housed until you do X, Y, and Z um, led to a high level of disengagement. We also saw a high increase in healthcare costs due to hospital utilizations with the uh, mental health, behavioral health, and sometimes chronic health conditions that a lot of our homeless population faced because there were all these additional barriers to getting housed, people would then engage our hospital systems, not only for healthcare, but also to meet, meet that basic need of housing as well. Um, and then there were, um, we identified that it was increasing barriers to accessing transitional housing and permanent housing. So in 1992, Pathways created um, the new housing first approach, which simply required tenants to pay 30% of their income for rent and to meet with their act team twice per month. That was the only requirement to become housed in this permanent supported housing model. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And with this model, we jump the steps. We're saying there is no prerequisite to housing. If you want housing, if you access the system, our goal is to get you into housing. We're going to connect you immediately, make sure that we have the access. And then we're going to also give ongoing support to you because it's not just how do we connect you to this housing, um, but how do we maintain that housing for you? Also, where are your needs? We're thinking about where your brain is right now. We're thinking about what your situation is right now. We're understanding that everyone doesn't have a one size fit all response to traumatic situations. We use harm reduction approaches and um, we believe that housing is a right. From, the, from there, we also 
continue to offer supportive service supportive services, that is just not a prerequisite to you getting housing. We continue to work with the participant on this journey to permanent housing and then maintaining their permanent housing. Next slide. Um, with this model, once again, another study was done to show that it led to a 30% reduction in homelessness. Um, also, it leads to quicker exits from homelessness because we're not having these prerequisites, because we're not believing that homelessness has underlying conditions, but homelessness is a situation that um, the individual entered into and we believe we're going to get you housed. We were able to lead to quicker exits from homelessness. Um, participants spent 73% of their time housed versus 32% of their time being housed using the linear model. Um, and there was also a decrease in homelessness by 88% and then improved housing stability, which is that longer term retention um, by 41%. Next slide. Um, and so although Housing First, this approach started with a permanent supportive housing model, it has then expanded to be used across our housing system. Uh, with your outreach and shelter services, um, we're making sure we're focusing on identifying safe options um, for housing and making sure we're doing assessments for our participants with diversion services. We try to prevent them from entering the homeless response system at all. I, making sure that as providers, we're not just jumping to, hey, let's get you to permanent housing, but let's assess the supports that you have already, right? This is also the belief that there's no underlying conditions to homelessness that doesn't, which means just because you lose your job doesn't mean you're going to fall into homelessness. What supports do you have? What co other community options do we have? What else can we connect you to to ensure <clears throat> that you're able to maintain your housing? Um, with our program, um, homeless prevention programs, um, what, what are we targeting in our communities for those that are most likely to become literally homeless? And how can we then as a community and provider respond to that? With our rapid rehousing programs, using all the flexibilities that we have provided to us to address the barriers for the clients. Once again, the barriers not to getting them housed, but let's, let's support them, let's get them document ready, let's make sure we're working with them. And then once we get them housed, let's continue to use all these different flexibilities we have and bridge them to permanent supportive housing if needed. Um, and then within permanent supportive housing, make sure we we're utilizing and engaging that robust clinical and health services coupled with supportive focused um, tenancy preservation, mainstream affordable, affordable housing, um, projects as well, using the deep sus subsidy that they have to maybe support the income barriers and then connecting with other supports that exist. And then when we use the private private market for housing, we're focusing on overcoming the retention barrier. So what leads to eviction? Once we get them permanently housed, once again, that's a right that's always going to be the goal. But how can we continue to support them to make sure that they're sustaining and retaining their housing and being able to navigate these barriers appropriately? Next slide, Doug. So a lot has changed um, from the linear model to where we are currently within our housing first system. Um, we don't believe that there are underlying conditions to homelessness. We don't believe that um, other steps need to be addressed prior to being able to get into permanent housing. We believe that housing is a right. It is not something that must be earned. It's not something that you have to prove your worthiness for. Um, homeless systems are specifically staffed. We believe in staffing our systems to be able to support the person, not just the system and how we believe it should work. But how do we make sure that we're supporting them maybe through peer supports? We're making sure that we are appropriately staffed to provide the supportive services needed in order to um, make sure that we're helping those navigate our system with, within a housing first approach. Next slide. Um, and it's been proven that Housing First works. Um, people move through our homeless system faster. They move out of homelessness faster. They stay out of homelessness. And um, we'll touch on this a little bit more when we're talking about retention. Um, the retention rates increase 
Um, they also, participants also expressed a greater control and choice. Um, and this is that autonomy we're speaking of, taking away some of the shame that they have in encountering the system. But it's not about what we believe the journey should be, working with them on their journey to permanent housing. Um, majority of participants do still engage in the supportive services, although it is optional. Once again, when we talk about linear model, it was either um, either you're going to work on these services in order to get housing, or we can't help you get housing at this time. Now we're saying housing is a right. You're, we're going to work with you to get this. And as you identify your needs and as you are willing to work on other stuff, we have these supportive services to offer you. Um, this leads to an increased quality in life, increase, uh, um, especially in areas of health and mental health. Um, and then also it saves our system money in the long run, um, especially when we talk about how homelessness um, does not happen in its own silo. It happens along with um, our chronic health conditions. It happens along with food insecurity. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Next slide. I think we jumped all the way to the end. Yeah, that was my bad. <laughs> I close your eyes a second here while I fix <laughs> fix my uh I think we're at the myth yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. We'll just remove this part of the recording, Christy. All right. <laughs> So your first um, myth versus fact. Housing first is a set of approaches that apply to permanent supportive projects focused on individuals with significant behavioral health diagnosis. If you can put in the chat, is that a myth or is that a fact? And we're going to give you another awkward pause for you to answer. They're coming in now. Yes. All right, Doug, you can go ahead. Correct. It is a myth. Our housing first principles started with permanent supportive housing, but once again, like stated earlier, they apply apply to the full spectrum of services. Um, this model can be used for people experiencing homelessness and for those facing housing instability. Next slide. And Doug's going to talk about housing in action. Yeah, and, and I want to just highlight that myth fact. It seems self-obvious. I think, uh, you know, we kind of set up these to be fairly easy to get folks to participate right on the, on the myth fact. But I think it is important. And it goes back to this shift over time from I have a housing first program to uh, we have programs and systems that have housing first orientation. And we often think about housing first, and frankly, it's still written about in some domains as, as purely a PSH model for highly vulnerable people, high, you know, folks that are very sick, that have, that have significant uh, barriers. Um, but what we've learned, and as Chelsea reviewed in the earlier slides, is that this is an orientation that no matter what your job is on this call, whether you are a funder, whether you're a case manager, a manager, a data person, whatever it may be, uh, you have a role in helping to promote uh, housing first approaches within your community. And I think it's really important to recognize that, that looks uh, that there are uh, services and nuances to how that's applied in different settings. And that is a conversation that we'll get into in later sessions. But just to sort of call that out a little bit. Um, but housing in action, uh, we want to just kind of get into now some of the basics. So there's three basic goals of housing first. Um, one is that we're making homelessness as rare and brief as possible. So we are trying to expedite the, our ability to either intervene for people who are on the precipice of losing housing. And I know that's very challenging in the prevention space or reconnecting people back into permanent housing as quickly as we can, sort of uh, regardless of or in recognition that in order to uh, rebuild uh, their goals, uh, housing becomes that, that foundation that we've talked about. 
Uh, so we are looking to help them obtain that housing as quickly as possible and then access the care and support needed to maintain that housing and achieve a better quality of life or other types of outcomes that they choose. Now, uh, one of the things that we hear in many places is uh, this confusion, and we're going to get into a little bit more after, around housing first is housing only. And we really want to make sure that we're clear, and we will say this multiple times, that housing first is not going to work as an approach or a set of principles unless uh, we are uh, including the services necessary to support that housing and we're creating the service packages that help people sustain that housing. It also does not mean that there are not um, uh, expectations on our clients or the folks that are that are gaining access to housing to be able to maintain that. There is the need for us to support basic tenancy preservation. How do we work to uh, ensure that this person can um, have a successful tenancy. That doesn't necessarily mean that their clinical or other types of goals are, are being pursued, uh, but how can we make sure they don't get evicted? How can we make sure they're not gonna lose that housing? And that becomes a key question. And when we get to a couple of sessions from now that focus really on the case management strategies, we're gonna break down the different types of barriers that folks face and how that then manifests into their overall tenancy preservation. Because our goal is not necessarily that everybody is going to be coming out of pot, is going to lift, be lifted out of poverty and be clean and sober, and their mental health is all going to be in check. They're going to have a job and be on their way. Our goal is to end homelessness. And what that looks like for different people based on their needs, their goals, their their situation is going to look different and those types of things they can pursue will look different so that not housing only becomes a really uh, core feature of this but we focus on that rapid intervention um chelsea mentioned diversion strategies what we've seen is that in a in a, in a highly trained and tuned up system that really puts a lot of front-end work on trying to help people identify other resources that they have in their community and their family or friend network, that many people who may present to us for services, who may request access to shelter, who may be reaching out via 211, may have other options, right? And the quicker we can intervene, the better to try to help people preserve housing. On the other side, of that equation, the longer that people are experiencing homelessness, the more trauma that they're experiencing, the deeper levels of stress, the more health or adverse health outcomes, the more morbidity outcomes come into play. Uh, and, and it becomes harder and harder for us to rehouse those folks. And it becomes harder and harder for us to provide the level of service they're going to need. We all know that the folks who have been chronically homeless or on our streets or in our communities for many, many years, uh, have significant challenges and we have significant challenges in finding uh, suitable housing options that can be safe, that we can um, uh, preserve tenancies within, that we can provide services. But that person who has been homeless for 10 years was also at one point homeless for one day. And if we were able to more quickly intervene in that, in that crisis, we know that their uh, health outcomes would have improved, their mental health may not have gotten to the state that it's in now, perhaps their substance use disorder may not have gotten to this state if we had been able to move that bar up. So from a system perspective um, uh, and a program perspective, the more quickly we can connect people back to some sort of stable living environment, the more likely we are to set them and ourselves up for success in that. And that requires us ensuring that we're providing self-determination and choice for the folks that we're working with. It is not only about the ability to accept people into programs that have uh, you know, sobriety issues or mental health history or criminal history, but how do we create an empowered model where folks are pursuing a self-determined set of goals? And that goes back to the discussion we started with around stress. How can you create a self-determination, uh, self-determined set of goals and really realize your choices if, you, if you're under the stress that don't even allow your brain to function in that way? Or how do we create choice in systems that have historically, frankly, reduced choices for people and able to access services and even further reduced choice, re reduce choices of people from different marginalized groups or groups that may have uh, different types of service needs, whether that be across racial lines or gender identification or uh, single parent households, whatever it may be, how do we create choices? But one of the key principles of Housing First is the idea that we are partners with that client, with that person in that experience of homelessness, and we are working to help them guide what that housing plan looks like. What do they need and want in order to be successful in their housing? We hear folks, and I'm sure this is uh, uh, something that is a feeling for folks on this call, 
I've had this feeling too. Those people don't want housing. I would argue that maybe they don't want the type of housing and services that we've offered so far, but it is a exceptionally rare occurrence that there's a human being who actively chooses to, to live on the street or in a tent or in their car or in an encampment or even an emergency shelter. Oftentimes it is about what those choices that have been provided to them are and how they can pursue those and whether that aligns with their needs and their values and their abilities at that time. So we want to make sure that uh, there are conditions on all, many of your grants. If you're HUD funded, whether it, you know there's case management requirements in certain programs, there are certain expectations from your MOUs, there are certain expectations from uh, state funding sources or local, there may even be conditions upon charitable giving that come into your organization or to your services. But service and compliance issues should not be our conditions of tenancy to the extent that they don't need to be with uh, outside of our funding stream. So uh, uh, if we can create an environment where compliance is not the underlying feature of how somebody maintains either the services in our projects or the housing that they're in, then we can focus on allowing folks to pursue their goals. And it is about delivering those right resources to the right people at the right point in time. So uh, an example of this, and, and this sounds so, so cliche, right? right, right person, right time, uh, all of that, you know, it's sort of um, uh, an oversung mantra. But if every single one of the housing plans that your case managers are developing start with the same four goals and they're already pre-written for folks and your housing plans aren't going to work because I'll tell you, I've made significant changes and I'm sure everyone on this call has made some significant change in their life. And it is very rare that people make significant changes in their life unless it's a goal that they want to pursue. Making change by force does not work. And so if we're able to provide that right resource to the right people, what is it they, they need to be successful? Is it that they do need to uh, pursue or are encouraged to pursue treatment because not because they have a mental health issue or a substance use issue, but because those issues are directly affecting their ability to sustain their tenancy? What can we do to help them mitigate against housing loss, even if they're going to continue with that behavior? I've used this example before. I'll use it again here. And I would love to see other examples in the chat. Uh, the chat is our tool really to, to bring you all in as best we can in this large call. Um, but when we think about tenancy issues uh, and, and, and readiness for housing, there are many people who are going to continue to have untreated mental health or untreated substance use disorder. And I, there was a great example that we had heard from the field a little bit ago. I've used this before, so I apologize if it's repetitive, but I think it's super useful. If we think about the right resource to the right person at the right time. So there was a client in a rapid rehousing program who uh, was uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. And when they were symptomatic uh, from their diagnosis, uh, they would play music exceptionally loud, very loud in their apartment. And it was becoming a problem with the neighbors and the landlord. And this person uh, would uh, pursue their treatment um, with uh, for their mental health, but you know, go off medication or, or uh, duck out of therapy for periods of time, and they would become symptomatic. They would blast the music, and uh, uh, their neighbors would get upset. And I think in our old way of thinking, this would become a housing barrier that was insurmountable. This person must go to treatment. They need to take their meds to stay in our program. We need to relocate them into a more service heavy presence so that we can make sure they're not, we need to take their stereo away uh, and all of these things. What this provider did was actually work with this client in recognizing that this symptomatic issues were gonna continue regardless of what the program hoped they would pursue in terms of treatment. And they worked with that client to purchase a, uh, an expensive pair of like Bose headphones. And so when that person was symptomatic, they could still blast that music. They could still get the relief that they needed from those mental health symptoms, but it was no longer causing an issue with their landlord and their neighbors. So then there became no longer an issue in retaining their housing for that particular issue, right? So uh, that's a simple example, but it's a, a creative thing that doesn't require pills and outpatient treatment and evictions that allows somebody to continue to uh, be housed, to be safe in that housing situation, to work through the mental health challenges that they have without disturbing their neighbors and landlords, preserving that tenancy and giving a platform for that project to continue to work with them in a creative way. This is one example of how we think about the right resource to the right people at the right time. It may be that somebody, you come in and somebody really wants uh, employment right now, uh, but, in, but they also recognize that they have significant health challenges that prohibit their employment. And on your predefined 
housing plan, you may have their employment and income outcomes as a first step. That might need to be step four. We may need to connect that person with primary care first. We may need to oversubsidize them in rapid rehousing for a few months, recognizing that it's going to take time for them to get on their feet uh, and overcome their health challenges to get back in the workforce or apply for uh, benefits. Other people may be in an opposite situation where their healthcare related needs are less uh, uh, prevalent or urgent, and we can work on income at that point in time, at the point of onset or the point of housing. So everybody has a different point in time when they're ready or wanting to pursue different types of services. But we don't condition housing based on that readiness of them to pursue those very services. So we, we recognize that folks are housing ready. And that means that we need housing to start with. And I want to just uh, start this section by acknowledging that we have an exceptionally tight market. You are under-resourced. We are in this, in this state, in our cities, our towns, and our counties. Whether you're from the North Country, whether you're from outside of Manchester, where I live, whether you're from the Seacoast area, we simply don't have enough affordable housing for everyone. When we get later into this series, we'll talk about coordinated entry. We'll talk about what are the hard decisions that we have to make with the limited resource pool we have in order to uh, have the greatest impact. But in a housing first environment, we need to focus on how we can, uh, as best we can within that finite resource environment, ensure that our housing is affordable, that it's safe, that it's lease based, right? So one of the um, uh, things to clarify is that while all of our points in system, our shelters, our transitional settings, our even you know sober living situations, all can work within a, a system that promotes housing first values and principles, the ultimate goal is for people to be permanently housed. And I, and I, and I will say this, and I am sure that there are some folks on the line that won't like it, but transitional housing is not permanent housing. Folks in transitional housing are still homeless and transitional housing is often, and probably not for all of you on the line who may operate it, but from a national perspective, transitional housing has been shown to be more expensive and have worse outcomes than direct access to permanent housing opportunities. So the money and the investment that we make in different settings matters when there's a trade-off toward a setting that may have greater outcomes or greater cost affordability for our overall system. But we're looking to ensure that folks have lease access, that they are protected under landlord tenant law, that they are uh, the lease holder or sub lesser on the units that they're providing, that we're assisting households to overcome those barriers to accessing and retaining that housing, and that our, our practices from the ground sort of direct care through supervision and program management levels are looking to prevent those lease violations and evictions. There's a lot of things that people can do in their units that we may not find good or healthy, or we may not think are the best goal for them that won't get them evicted. And it's important to recognize that our role is to help them maintain housing while supporting other goals, even if some of the behaviors or um, uh, things that they're doing in their life may not feel uh, healthy to us or what we might want to pursue in our own goals. So it requires us, right, to do more than just case management. Um, I'm a firm believer that every community should have dedicated housing navigation services and then housing navigators working with direct care staff need to be able to work with, speak the language of support our landlords. I saw in the chat the challenges with public housing authorities. Absolutely something we should talk about in future sessions now that that's been brought up. Um, how do you work with management companies? This is a skill set. This is an effort that takes time. It takes uh, expertise. It takes frustration. It takes a uh, surprise success in working not only with the tenant on, on how they can uh, you know um, manage different challenges in their life within a housing situation, but how do we bring landlords on board and build trust? How do we work with PHAs to do some testing, to, to pilot some ideas around bringing folks either directly from the street or I think in New Hampshire, you also have or have had some move on strategy for people who have entered housing in very uh, uh, challenging clinical situations that now have stabilization time and can move toward a more mainstream voucher. How can we work with those relationships to help people access housing and then respond to landlords to uh, mitigate against concern? Um, Oftentimes, we think of our landlords and our property owners as other clients. They need care and attention. They are stressed. Uh, they have deeper concerns about that property. And their concerns are not whether uh, I am actively drinking or if I have an active me mental health concern uh, in, in the unit. Their concern is whether my drinking leads to partying, the police being called, and property damage, or my mental health issues lead to land, uh, 
client complaints or if my if my rent is getting paid on time. Right. So thinking about the ways that we support landlords, and we're going to dive deep into that when we get to more of the direct care discussions in future sessions. But housing first is not just on the client side of the equation. It is a system practice that includes the partners, our most important partners, oftentimes, who are the folks who own the housing that we need access to in order for us to to make any sort of dent or strides toward ending homelessness individually for people and as systems. So here's a quick little checklist, right? And this is uh, uh, from USICH. It's about as self-apparent as, as it can be. But do you accept, and this is for all levels. This is for your shelter projects. This is for transitional housing. This is for uh, uh, your permanent housing projects. Are you able to accept participants that are not sober? Um, and if you are a sober living project, uh, which is not uh, antithetical to Housing First, we can have sober living environments in a Housing First setup as long as the ability or the uh, move toward those environments is based on the choice and goals of the client themselves. So even if you only accept folks that are sober, are folks making an active choice to go into that sober living environment because that is a goal that they want to pursue? Do you allow, to the extent that your subsidy packages allow uh, you to do so, bring people in that have little or no income upon entry? If you're a rapid rehousing provider, do you have flexibilities within your rental assistance packages to serve people with no income, or do you give everybody three months at 50% of their income in rent and pay a security deposit? If you're doing that, um, you're not doing rapid rehousing correctly, right? A rapid rehousing is a highly flexible project model that allows for deep subsidies for some, allows for shallower subsidies when not needed, allows for different um, prolonged durations of that subsidy. Um, and so are you able to serve participants based on your program design in order to uh, work with people who do have those greatest uh, income barriers or other things like that? Does your case planning focus on that uh, regaining of housing as quickly as possible? Can participants refuse uh, non-funder uh, mandated services and maintain their housing? So all of these questions point toward whether or not your orientation as a shelter, as an outreach provider, as a housing provider are oriented toward a housing first uh, uh, environment? Will you work with somebody who's on the street who's actively drinking or using while you're working with them? Are you uh, uh, putting benefits applications and, and, and employment applications in before you consider the housing plan? Is your housing plan predetermined or is it focused on an individual support system? Can the participants refuse your services and do you still show up to offer them and to give them different choices and how they may pursue those? So it is not a housing only approach. It, it requires that partnership. Um, the services are voluntary. And while I recognize that there are um, uh, services that uh, may be required by your funders, or you may need to use harm reduction and, and uh, motivational interviewing approaches to help people understand the realities of their choices. Voluntary doesn't mean that we don't create the choice. It may be that unless you change this behavior, we fear you're going to be evicted and lose your housing again, and it's going to be hard to get you rehoused. What can we do to help mitigate against these choices or mitigate against the idea that you're going to get evicted because of them? So while those choices are voluntary, we also are trying to create an atmosphere where folks understand the choices they have ahead of them. What is their ability uh, to, to reframe or to uh, change their behaviors that would mitigate against their housing loss? and their overall uh, lack of housing stability. So we consider housing as, uh, or housing first approaches, housing oriented approaches, use whatever term you'd like, but they're for anybody. If our system is gonna respond to people who are in a housing crisis, the first thing that we do across any type of client or family or, or, or participant that we work with is recognizing that our orientation is back toward housing. That becomes our foundation. So it may be individuals or families. It may be folks with higher needs. It may be everyone in between. It may be folks that have been chronically homeless for a very long time. It could be folks that are uh, newly homeless and just need a rapid intervention. How we make choices about the way in which we target resources is, a broad, is another discussion for a future session. Because ultimately, if we had enough money and enough services to serve everybody, we wouldn't be in this training right now. We'd all have succeeded in our jobs. We'd all be running prevention programs. But we've got lots of folks who are on the street today, right? And there's not enough resources for everybody. So we'll talk about that system approach as we get along in, in the next session or two. But for today, just to recognize that from a system orientation, 
uh, or a basic principle orientation, our ability to focus on housing as the prerequisite backbone to everything else we do applies across all populations. And it applies differently amongst different populations with different needs. And it applies differently amongst different populations with different life uh, histories and experiences. Um, so when we think about uh, housing readiness, uh, we want to make sure to re-emphasize that housing is that crisis. And there are some people who are going to need very little support. Others are going to need intensive longer term support. Some people we're going to, we can start with a lighter touch support package, and then we have to escalate it from there. I'm a firm believer that most permanent supportive housing should be reserved for people who have been rapidly rehoused and have shown that they need that escalated level of support for permanent supportive housing, because we often underestimate people and what that initial housing linkage can do. There are a lot of people, and I, and I hope that there's been this experience on the line, who we say, there's no way this person is gonna stabilize without a full subsidy forever, deep clinical supports, uh, connections to all of these different services. And then they get into housing, and things begin to improve very quickly. Perhaps their mental health and their stress are, are reduced and they're able to sustain that. Perhaps they're able to access income streams and employment. Somebody even who's been homeless a long time who had no other support systems, maybe they're in housing now and their family is now coming back into their life and, and being a support system to them in that housing. On the other hand, we recognize that there are folks that on paper, on our assessment forms and how we score human beings and put them on a spreadsheet, look like they can easily access housing on their own, but we get into that situation, we get them rehoused, we find them, those connections to landlords, we're starting that service engagement, and all of a sudden we start to uncover deeper layers of trauma and need that really are going to require a more robust housing package. So we think about how our systems interact, and we're going to get into that more, but the, but the main point being that we are looking at homelessness not as a condition or uh, uh, you know, a, a characteristic of somebody, but a crisis situation that we need to address as quickly as possible to reduce that length of time homeless, reduce that trauma, work with people to um, uh, focus on those supports, and then think about those other goals that they want to pursue. We want to pursue sobriety. We want to help people with treatment. We want to help people with criminal records. But in order for us to help them be successful tenants, we may not need to address all of those issues, at least from a compliance point of view. So um, as we go forward, we're going to talk more about um, services and housing when some other sessions, particularly for direct care, um, but first, you know, we talked about that ACT team model, you know, myth fact. So when we operate housing first programs, you really need a dedicated acute clinical treatment team. You need that robust clinical service package team in place. Who thinks this is true? Who thinks this is a myth or partly true? Let's put that in the chat as well. And, um, you know, the ACT model really was the, the basis for housing first back in the, in the 90s. Um, is this a myth or a fact that we see here? We have a couple of myths so far. A few myths, so we'll go with that. Um, so false, right? So in the early models of Housing First, and, and still today, frankly, a lot of folks think that they only can do this with an ACT team or an equivalent, a PAC team, an ACT team, a dedicated clinical service, uh, wraparound uh, service model team. Um, something equivalent to that. And that's still an important feature of many projects, right? Uh, especially when you talk about people with deep clinical needs, folks with significant mental health issues that are unmanageable or unsafe in housing, those. And I think in, in New Hampshire, we see this even more so, um, not so much the ACT model, but really deeper treatment models around folks who are uh, addicted to opioids or things like that. But housing first approaches do not assume that everybody is gonna need that, that it's a one size fits all model our services need to adapt to those unique needs. And sometimes that means that we start with lighter services and, and need to bring in the equivalent of an ACT team, or we start with an ACT team and recognize that that is not a, serv a, a needed service. So if you operate projects that require engagement with these deeper, much more expensive service packages, it's worth looking at, is that necessarily uh, a, a prerequisite or a, um, a required service that you're delivering for folks to maintain their housing in a safe way. In some places it will be, other places it may not be. So we break down that barrier. 
Now, this is another one. Housing First programs offer flexible client-driven supportive services. This is uh, a little bit easier. I won't even pause for this, just watching the time. But that's true. We know that some people are not going to want to engage in the services or goals, especially the ones that we set for them. So we try to create those individual goals and housing plans. My favorite type of housing plan template that projects use are mostly blank. They start with the client's articulation or the tenant's articulation of what it is they want to achieve, what they think they can achieve in what periods of time, and what supports they need to achieve those. And that can only be done if we're flexible, if we allow for that client-driven empowerment, if we're really having the clients drive the types of services that, the services and engage in. So that means that they may vary levels, right, um, uh, that are offered. It means that they're flexible. It means that even if your funder requires you to meet with somebody in case management once a month, for some people that's enough and other people you will need to then uh, be meeting every day or twice a, a week or doing home visits uh, three times a week, right? So from a direct care perspective, we think about housing plans as a conversation with our clients. From a management perspective, we have to think about what does that imply for us in terms of caseloads? If you have a one to 25 caseload and you have one case manager who has a, a, a number of folks who need intensive uh, services, even in like a rapid rehousing or shelter environment, and another case manager whose clients really only need a check-in once a month, how do we think about that from a caseload management perspective? How do we ensure that our case um, uh, sort of supervision and oversight of case management is promoting a client-centered approach and tailoring our services to the needs of the household and then being able to ebb and flow. It may be that somebody feels really stable for a number of months and PSH, rapid rehousing or whatnot, and then a crisis occurs and now we need to re-intervene with a stronger uh, or, or, or more robust service package to get that person back on track with that longer term goal of helping them uh, uh, maintain that housing over time. Uh, so that means, you know, we're, we're focused on that individual uh, work. Uh, we're trying to help people create independent uh, decisions. We're trying to reintegrate people into their community. One of the things that we know is that homelessness is a silo for many people. It is uh, not only uh, based on the folks that see you on the street, but it is one of those things that pulls people out of their community. They create community within a system that we've designed, oftentimes designed to keep them in that system. And they've lost touch with the rest of their of their community. I mean, we think about family supports. We think about people, you know, joining um, uh, religious or faith based groups. We think about people who want to go to the gym. We think about people who want to go to taco tour in a couple of weeks in downtown Manchester and not be, you know, looked at as if they're trying to steal things or that they're some sort of nuisance on Elm Street in Manchester. And thinking about what it means to be part of community and using those support systems to help people reintegrate into those things in their lives that give purpose, that give empowerment, and that allow them uh, to live uh, as, as fruitful as they can, as healthy as they can. So that means that we break our services in different parts. And we're going to explore this in uh, much more deeply in a couple of sessions. But thinking about the distinction between those transition services into housing, what does it mean to match people to an appropriate unit subsidy project? What does it mean to then help them overcome the barriers to accessing those, which are often uh, are most often focused on what the landlord is concerned with versus what does it take to sustain that housing? Once they're in housing, how do we help them preserve that? It is often as difficult to help people preserve housing as it is to help them access housing. We can get anybody housing. We can subsidize them for a few months, get them a lease, negotiate with the landlord. Some places even have incentives in different parts of the country or for the through VA services to give the landlord a bonus for that. Um, I've actually advocated for that with our local public officials. That's the fund that we need is an incentive fund for our, our housing owners. And we can get them in, but now what do we do? How do we keep them there, right? And so the service package, the goal planning looks different between those two distinctions as well. And we'll dig into that as we go. So those transition services is about identifying those preferences, thinking about how we support housing surge, pairing up either char through charitable uh, organizations, through goodwill, uh, and I don't mean big G goodwill, goodwill of humans, as well as our funding sources, the basic costs, and then planning for that move and supporting that plan uh, into that. And then looking at what does it mean to sustain as we go? How do we make sure they understand their tenancy obligations in leach? How do we coach and work with the landlord to understand that while our tenants may be a little bit more challenging uh, as tenants, we can help preserve those tenancies in that partnership? Can we resolve those disputes? One of the biggest things that we've seen 
lately is uh, the ability um, a dedicated mediation training for case managers and PSH. Because when landlords get upset, there needs to be somebody that can talk with that landlord in a way that is mediating against uh, housing loss, mitigating against that housing loss and working to come up with common uh, outcomes that are positive for both the landlord, the neighbors, and the tenant, and preventing those evictions or housing loss, and then thinking about what it means to then uh, uh, move forward uh, in that leasing process. So what does it take to get someone in? How do we then keep them in? Those are different types of plans that we'll explore more as we go along this series. And then that coordination with the tenant to update those housing support plans. And that may be very simple. Uh, folks who haven't cooked a meal for themselves in a while may need food preparation support? How do we get them shopping? Do they have family in the area that can bring them to the grocery store once a week and, and reintegrate into that part of their, their, uh, their society or their community? Are we able to support them in money management? Are there ways to make sure that if they are going to have guests or they are going to have a party once in a while, if they're actively drinking, that we can reduce the, their effect on neighbors or the police being called? If they have repairs that need in their apartment, when do you call the landlord at midnight versus when do you wait till Monday morning to let them know either the pipe is broken in the ceiling or the light bulb's out? Uh, we used to work with a PSH client in an old role of mine that, um, you know, we had to have some sit down mediation with the landlord because they, literally they would call the landlord at midnight on a Saturday because the light burned out. But then they wouldn't call when the toilet was overflowing and creating a flood downstairs. So we literally had to write down here are the things you call the landlord in an emergency about. Here's what you let your case manager know about, and here's when you call the landlord within a couple of days and they'll get back to you. What are those expectations as a tenant so that we can make sure that you're not creating problems for yourself and that we can help you understand what that role as a tenant is? It's easier said than done. Every one of our 40 slides so far is easier said than done, but it is a practice that leads to better housing outcomes overall. And with that, uh, housing outcomes overall, I want to turn it back to Chelsea who's going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, as we get into this last 20 minutes or so of our of our discussion, I'll keep an eye on the chat too. If folks want to share any stories that they have that kind of reflect some of what we've talked about here. So Chelsea, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And you can advance two slides actually, Doug. <clears throat> All right. Um, so when we're talking about housing for first outcomes, we're looking at it within your community, right? How do we know that housing first is working? How do we know that we're getting the outcomes that we're wanting? How do we know how we need to change how we're operating as a program and to make sure that we're operationalizing housing first approaches correctly and that we're using equity to drive how we um, engage in these services? So the first thing in determining the effectiveness of your housing first is housing first approach is going to be relying on the capture of data, right? We have to use data in order to show what we've been doing, what's been working, how we've been growing as a community, how we've been making sure that we've been reaching our outcomes with our participants. When we're, when we're utilizing the data, certain examples of housing first outcomes is going to be, is it showing that our length of stays in shelters have decreased? From using this model, are we able to quickly get people from homelessness to housing? Are we reducing the length of stay by housing placement? The data will show, you know, is it different? Is it differing based on age, gender, um, the locale within our state? Um, are some communities or some programs able to reduce the length of time from homelessness to housing? Um, are we decreasing recidivism rates within homelessness? Are the supportive services that we're offering within the community, are the connections that we're making to other uh, supports able to really keep our people not just getting them housed, but retaining them in that housing and ensuring that they don't have to circle back to our homeless response system. Um, that also goes to increasing the length of, of time housed. And then health status changes, right? Because the supportive services, this is not housing only, from the work that we're doing and the, um, the services that we're offering, the, the supports that we're giving, are we noticing that, hey, we're able to decrease as a community overall ER visits, right? Homelessness does not happen in a silo, as mentioned before, um, but many of our participants that are engaged in our homeless response systems are also engaged in several other systems, whether it's the healthcare system, um, food insecurity, different things. And so we're able to also see, are we able to improve outcomes in those arenas? And then are we able to increase um, income and attaining employment? And that can be all collected through data. Next slide, Doug. 
Um, so uh, USICH believes, once again, like we've been saying all throughout the slide, that housing is a right, not a privilege. However, we do understand that there are equity concerns um, that, that come into play when we're trying to get our participants from homelessness to housing. Um, and so the, in a statement they stated, we will never be able to end homelessness until everyone has the equal opportunity to live in safe and affordable housing. Um, they believe that in doing that, there's some key things as a community we can do to implement housing first. One of those is including those with lived experience in the decision making, planning and implementation of policies and procedures. Sometimes, you know, as providers, we have our or just individuals living in the community. We have our own individual biases. We don't necessarily under understand the entire process. So including those that have lived experience, including those that have gone through these situations, have in interacted with our programs, have gone through our systems, and helping us determine, hey, what can we fix within our systems? How can we tweak these policies and procedures? How can we be more trauma-informed in the work that we're doing? Including them can definitely help us drive equity when we're implementing Housing First approach. Also including race equity as a core component um, of priority planning and corresponding goals. Understanding that some of our systems were built from an inherently um, racist place, understanding that it was meant to be discriminatory and exclude certain people from having access to affordable housing. So in order to combat that, we have to be intentional with including these, these things, these determining factors, race equity, um, into how we determine to solve the problem, how we include it within our system. And then also increasing opportunities for access to equitable housing and other systems, such as healthcare, education, transportation and employment. We understand that all of these things work together to, to increase long-term housing stability, right? We can't just, like Doug mentioned earlier, we can put people in housing, but how do we ensure that we're giving them all the supports to stay there? So we need to look at healthcare, education, transportation, employment, and various other systems at play in our communities and use equity in those lenses to ensure that we're um, leaning towards long-term housing stability. Next slide, Doug. Once again, making sure that we're really focusing on those marginalized groups once again, historically disenfranchised groups, including racial, ethnic, and sexually mar marginalized groups, they have faced stress when it comes to encountering the systems and the structures, as well as interpersonal prejudice and discrimination within all of these systems. So how do we look at the roots of racism within our society and the effects that they've had within all the systems that we have to engage in in order to really create a more robust homeless response system. Um, we want to look at the various of life, the various areas of life that these stressors can come in and how it's limiting the access to housing, how it's increasing housing insecurity, how all of this connects to job insecurity, food insecurity, and the relationships that people may have in engaging with the system, engaging with safe and affordable housing, engaging with a appropriate health care. Next slide. So we want to take this time to reflect. Maybe in the chat you guys can um, discuss a little bit, but we know that many people on this call um, have family members or close friends who struggle with drugs or alcohol or maybe some other things that people identify as underlying conditions to homelessness, which we know is not true, but just have different um, challenges in life. And we want you guys to think, do you guys think that these challenges or barriers um, lead to a person's homelessness? Would it be acceptable for your family or your friend, mem um, friend or even yourself to say, hey, I'm having these challenges, and so this is going to lead to our homelessness? And in an effort of time, we're going to keep moving forward, Doug. Um, so in our final myth versus fact, uh, programs committed to housing first strategies should not focus on sober living and recovery oriented living environments. If you guys could put in the chat, do you believe that to be a myth or a fact?
Chelsea, I think we made our myths and facts too easy. Or this group's <laughs> just point. Yeah. All righty. We'll go ahead, Doug. Yeah, a lot of myths coming in, and you guys are correct. Once again, like Doug said, sober living environments are in line with the housing first principles if our participants, that's right, you guys are smart. <laughs> uh, if our housing per first participants choose it, if it's a goal that they believe they want to accomplish, it should not be something that we're forcing on them. Um, we should also make sure that uh, it avoids lease termination if someone relapses or chooses not to pursue recovery as a treatment goal. And next slide. So we just want you guys to take uh, these last couple of minutes, read through this case example. Um, I'll read it out loud. And then maybe in the chat discuss, um, you know, are we uh, within this case example? Is it operating within housing first principles? If it's not, what are some things that we need to change in order to ensure that we are operating um, at using housing first approach. Um, so for Robert, a shelter has referred Robert to a COC permanent su supportive housing program that has beautiful re uh, relatively new units. The program requires weekly meetings with a case manager. Robert is meeting with a staff member of the housing program to see if he is eligible. Here's what Robert shares in response to the staff question. I've been homeless for a long time. I don't have any money and I can't work. I used to have an apartment long time ago. I was evicted because of using alcohol and all the people that came into my apartment. I tried to get clean, but it was hard. It is very hard being in the shelter, too, too hard to sleep and deal with my diabetes. The staff member tells Robert that housing program doesn't allow alcohol use and gives him a referral for a substance abuse treatment program and a transitional housing program so he can work on getting clean and learn good tenancy skills. So like Doug put in the chat, um, we're gonna give you guys a few minutes to respond in the chat or maybe come off mute and discuss what are some changes um, to Robert's services that would be better support housing first principles? What is good in this situation and what could we improve? We have a quiet chat group. Maybe an introspective reflection here is, um, and I'm sure there are some amongst the 60 folks on the line, is this something your program does? Uh, I suspect there are somebody, you know, programs on the line that uh, if somebody's referred and is actively using, they'll get the referral to a different setting. And that and that is a, a an arc, right? A, a discussion, a, an opportunity, to continue to look at practices. Um, so they're they're working to give him resources. Thank you, Christina. Any others? As your COC program administrator, I would ask if any of you require weekly meetings with the case manager. Yep, thank you, Beth. Um, denied housing based on past uh, is the worst. Um, it's showing proving your worth. Thank you, Christina. Beth, um, that doesn't allow alcohol. Again, maybe this PSH project does have a recovery orientation. Um, so even going from a system perspective, let's just, let's assume that this project does. Um, how does the system refer Robert to this and create choices before that referral to reflect that what Robert really wants? Um, and, and that may look different, right? I just want to highlight case scenarios are really difficult after 86 minutes on a webinar. Um, but 
I put this in the chat. I really think supervisors on the line and others should be thinking about how do you create complex, and this is a simple one, complex case scenarios and use those in supervision. Use those as a case conferencing internal opportunity to support your staff who are working through these issues day in and day out with folks like Robert and trying to be supportive that way to identify what's going well, what's What's a challenge? Where are there barriers that maybe we, we maybe we're putting up arbitrar arbitrarily and trying to make those course corrections? Um, Housing first can encourage that treatment without uh, without uh, the barriers. Great. Um, so with that, we just have a few minutes, and I know this was a lot of didactic, and we were uh, frankly, you know, there's a lot of folks on the line, so we have to find ways to be interactive with you all. But with our five minutes left. I don't know if there's anything, that, Christy, you wanted to highlight or anything that you want to emphasize that, that we brought up or the remaining training, or if there's anyone on the line who has questions um, or wants to raise any uh, anything either verbally or in the chat that we can talk about, knowing we've got, uh, you know, other five sessions in the series, uh, monthly series going through this year. So I don't know if anyone has any questions. I would just say, uh, from the balance of state perspective, I believe all of our current projects are housing first, which is phenomenal, um, and utilize and practice housing first practices and best guidance. I'm just gonna see if there's any questions because I know we have three whole minutes left. Just to preview while folks may be doing that, um, now that you've been on this session, um, you know, the other session, again, we're going to work to mix in interaction. It's hard when there's 60 plus people, but uh, we are planning this series and you have the agenda for what we're going to be focused on. Some will be very relevant to your direct care staff, others a little more relevant to system planners, data folks. We hope everybody will attend all of them, but we do encourage you, especially for those direct care uh, ones um, coming up that you know case management teams join these calls and other folks i don't think there's a limit christy on the number of people that can join um you know even to listen in i think there's a session where we're really going to dig into that distinction between tenant screening barriers and retention barriers and landlords and coordinated entry and how do we orient shelters and you know systems in a way that um can provide basic necessity while supporting people to try to move toward uh, uh safer alternatives um uh, discussing how to get agencies on board. I think part of our goal is to help people get on board through understanding um, uh, this. Uh, there's only so much evidence we can present and and without breaking down doors, right? It's more cost effective. It's better for human beings. We have better performance systems. Sometimes we have to swallow our pride, but that's the deal. Um, and we'll continue to try to convince folks of that, Christina, and, and try to re, re reinvigorate that. Um, and yes, eviction prevention. Anything else? Kathy, I'm glad this has been helpful. Tammy as well. So we're right about at the hour. Christy, I'll let you close this out. I think this recording is available. I'll also send you the slides that you can distribute to the group. Uh, just to encourage folks again, we have an outline for the next six months, but if there's stuff missing or if this is completely useless to you and there's something else that could be more useful, we can't uh, meet everybody's needs in a 65 person webinar, but we can certainly make adaptations to best meet the needs of the most people. So communicate that with me, with Christy, with others, like how can we be most useful if we're going to take 90 minutes of your valuable time once a month for the next six months, we want to make sure because you right now you're here with me and not with a client, right? P helping them get out of homelessness. So we want to make sure that's valuable. So we're okay with critical feedback that gives us an opportunity to improve the experience that you have the knowledge and the way that we can support you as a team. So with that, I'll give it back to Christy to close this out. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to both Doug and Chelsea. This was a phenomenal kickoff to the Housing First series. Um, and I am getting a lot of emails and messages that they thoroughly enjoyed this training. Um, our next training will be on May 15th. It is focused on system level housing focus practices, including coordinated entry, which is as you all know, one of my other favorite topics and Doug's favorite topic. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you there. We will be sharing this recording um, and the slides with all of you. I don't know if everyone knows, we do have a DHHS YouTube channel. 
Um, but we will be putting this training up there and hoping to also share it with the New Hampshire Coalition to End Homelessness for their training library. Um, so let us know if there's any feedback or anything you want to see from this training series. We did send out the agenda and what we're going to cover, but we're happy to look at other topics and things that all of you want to discuss. And thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chelsea and Christy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. If there's no other questions, I'm going to stop recording.